In a world where high-performance, zero-defect buildings are hard to find, two men are on a mission to disrupt the status quo. Welcome to the Enifis Complex, the property design and development podcast. Let your hosts, Adam Muggleton and Robert Bean, keep you up with who is innovating and doing great work, perspective on the adjacent possible, and challenges to the status quo. Welcome to the Edifice Complex. I'm Robert Bean, your co-host and unofficial mediator, here with my colleague and official agitator, friend and Yoda of most things, everything to do with buildings, Mr. Adam Muggleton. Say hello, Sir Yoda. Hello there, everybody. I am the agitator against the status quo, as long as it moves in the right direction, which has to be better. So that's it for me. Excellence is what I get excited about. And if Adam gets out of control, I'll step in and try to retain the peace. So today's episode, we're launching into our uh, discussions on sustainability and resiliency with our special guest, Holly Chant. She's an internationally recognized leader in the principles of sustainability public policy development and integrated design processes, really all things that are good in the world of modern architecture. Holly, welcome to the show. Good morning. Our, gosh, did I just do that again, you guys? It's so nice to see you. Um, <laughs> I'm delighted to be here. <laughs> yeah, the, t- Holly, uh, the time difference Holly- is quite extreme, right? So Holly is in the UAE. We're in Canada. That's a uh, so nine hour 10 hour difference for you, Robert? <laughs> yeah, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's evening here and, and breakfast time where Holly is. So, Holly, uh, the world wants to know how you ended up in the uh, United Emirates uh, working with an award winning uh, design team. It's a pretty interesting story. So, tell us how you got there. Sure, sure, Robert. Thanks. Well, right around the global property crash, uh, my husband and I were looking for new opportunities. And like many other people around the globe, there just weren't any in the United States or in uh, Europe. And a very dear friend of ours said, why don't you head over to the UAE? There's loads of great projects going on here. So we did. And she was right. And originally, I was interviewing to join the Mazdar City project. But I had the opportunity to visit a lot of other employers and the long and the short of it is I took a gig working for the Abu Dhabi Urban Planning Council on the Estadama program. Estadama is like Abu Dhabi's version of LEED or BRIAM and I started out there. It was a great experience and then eventually I moved on to KO International Consultants when they asked me to start their sustainability department. Wow, that's impressive. Uh I'm very interested to hear your your opinions on the differences between LEED, Estadama, and Briam. I personally have a bit of a love hate relationship with LEED, but uh, <laughs> that's not because really, Adam. <laughs> that's not because I'm a Brit. Uh, I just I think Briam, in my experience, is quite efficient because it's British. No one knows about it, right? It's the best kept secret in the world. Uh, LEED is a very been excellent at raising the level and the bar for sustainability, but. For me, it has some weaknesses. You know, when the lead design checklist is the design driver for a building, that becomes a bit depressing for me. I I agree. I agree. Yeah. Uh, A checklist shouldn't drive uh, design. Collaboration and the owner's performance requirements should drive design. And those shouldn't be uh, defined or constrained by lead Estadam or Briam or anything. Um, It really should be about the... The vision of having a great building that's efficient and healthy for the occupants. Um, so I understand your frustration, but not everybody thinks the way you do. And uh, the- <laughs> thank goodness. <laughs> yeah. so, <uh-oh. laughs> uh, so the the I guess the best case scenario is that that organizations like Lead have grown a really dynamic market and expertise of sustainability practitioners around the world. Um, And the worst case scenario is, yeah, people just chase checks and boxes. And that's a shame. It is because it's sort of self-defeating, really. What about you, Robert? What's your experience on that? Well, you know, I tend to agree with the positions presented here. But I guess one of the things that LEED has done is it has brought awareness to the elements of good buildings. It has lots of flaws, but 
in terms of making people aware of some things that we need to pay attention to, I think it's done a great job of that. Yeah, I, I agree. And that really is about um, excellent marketing, education programs, and like strength of brand. And I think it's very interesting that a lot of people don't actually realize that if you compare lead to Bram, Bram has been around a lot longer than lead. And for quite a while, if you really looked at the numbers, Bram had a lot more buildings that had been through their program. But the strength of the lead brand um, is really created this like dynamic force in the sustainability world. And I think that that is something that um, all of us have to um, appreciate and embrace because sustainability uh, at this point, if, if you're not really helping people understand the value that a strong sustainability aspiration can bring to a brand, you're missing part of what gets people to really commit to it. So I don't, I don't know if that makes sense without kind of crunching it around a bit, but part of what LEAD has done besides bring these good criteria is show the market that there's a brand power there. And brand power really usually equates to some commercial viability. Yeah, I mean, for me, the, the genius of lead is the marketing. I mean, it's a North American phenomenon, right? And in North America, energy costs are low, water use is abundant, right? There's not a lot of reason to be energy efficient. So the genius of lead is the marketing and making it an aspirational target. It's created a market where there wasn't one, quite frankly, in North America. And I think that's its absolute genius. But how does Estadama fit between LEED and BRIAM? Is it more aligned with BRIAM or more aligned with LEED in its application? I'd say it's probably more aligned with LEED, but I don't want people to have the impression that it's a copy of LEED because it's not at all. In fact, one of the really interesting things about Estadama is one of the original consultants on it who worked with me at the um, Estadama uh, department of the UPC in Abu Dhabi was Bill Reed. And Bill Reed was actually one of the original founders of LEAD. And he was really passionate when he started on Estadama that Estadama not repeat some of the mistakes that he felt had developed in LEAD. Or maybe mistakes is the wrong word, but he, he really watched how LEAD did have some struggles in the early days with that whole checklist thing. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, all of us can quote um, the fact that once upon a time, a bike rack had more value or equal value to PV, right? And that really yeah. annoyed a lot of people. And it annoyed Bill. And it also annoyed Bill that the importance of the integrative design process wasn't really, really nailed down in the very early applications of LEAD. So Bill brought in this wonderful thought leadership to the development of Estadama, which not only looked at great things to take from LEAD, but also the constraints. And then we, we had other consultants who were very involved with Estadama that brought in really good things from Green Star from other applications that were not just building focus, but looking at infrastructure and communities. And cumulatively, I think that this brought in some nuances to Estadama that are, are quite special and particularly very regionally, locally specific to Abu Dhabi. And, and that was something that was very, very important to the Urban Planning Council was that, that it be specific to Abu Dhabi. Mm. Holly, do you have uh, a feel for which one of the, well, maybe put it this way, you know, when we talk about integrated design, the, the, the opposite of that, of course, is segregated design. And of the three programs that you're familiar, familiar with, do one of them really still have the faults or flaws of segregated design still sort of residing in the, in the design process? Like I still see lead projects where, you know, mechanical engineers aren't talking to electrical engineers or interior designers aren't talking to the mechanical designers in lead. Does that happen elsewhere? I, you know what? I don't think that that happening is the fault of any of the, the programs. I think that our industry is just an industry that 
has a kind of natural segregation between disciplines. And particularly when you're working on projects that are under tight budget, tight time constraints, and hello, isn't that just about all of them? (laughs) Um, (laughs) (laughs) It's really, really easy for people to just stay with their own tribe. So I don't at all think that it's, uh, it's the fault of these programs. And no program, nothing printed on a piece of paper is the art. The art is in the application. It's in the practitioners. It's in the people who are facilitating it. So if, if there's projects where that facilitation is not happening, maybe because the budget didn't allow for a, a specialist to facilitate the lead or Estadama or Briam process, I think that's more the critical issue. And, and that's really, I think, about... Um, the design team or maybe the the activities that happen pre-commencement of design where we haven't educated clients of the value of having a a sustainability facilitator, you know, or or perhaps that a company has not really figured out a way to have a facilitator, at least in, you know, concept and scheme, who's who's going to, you know, where it's not an add-on cost to the client, but that they're going to help ensure that that IDP happens um, and gets the project rolling. I've worked on a couple of projects with integrated design process and they were lead platinum actually. And boy, they were tough because they were, I've probably worked on 70 lead projects total so far. And the two that were platinum, they were proper integrated design process and it was brutal. But the outcome was a great set of drawings and specs. Very resolved, very well put together, right? But tough on the design team. Well, when you when you were say they were brutal or they were tough, how how in in what sense? And that it was just so many iterations of discussion or So let's let's be frank here. A lot of MEP electrical and architect design is copy and paste, right? So when you're doing a lead platinum building, you can't copy and paste the same old shit into it, right? So on these lead platinum projects, we were really pushing the envelope on energy efficiency. So you had to do everything properly. There was no phoning it in anywhere. So people had to do work. There was no taking the last VAV job you did and copying it all in. There was none of that. And there was a client there who was well-informed and he wanted to know what was going on and what was up. And, you know, and people were just not used to this level of scrutiny and this level of work. And, you know, they were exhausted at the end of it, me included, quite frankly. <laughs> and, and, and so I bet in addition to the fact that um, you couldn't phone it in, so yeah. to speak, um, also people's vulnerabilities get those buttons get pushed about the fact that yeah. they haven't done it before. They yes. don't understand that. And, and I think particularly for engineers, um, you know, where there's so much at stake, it's really hard to go into that place of having to say, I don't really know what's going on here. And, and how does it all tie into this lead business? And, um, <laughs> I, you know, yeah. seriously, and, yeah. and I, I think a lot of sustainability accredited professionals, whatever system that you're in, are not MEP professionals. They might be from architecture or environmental management or in in the early days of my team one of my best APs her background was biology so you put the (laughs) the the biologist who's gone into you know a a long trajectory of specialization that you can do as a sustainability accredited professional with the MEP engineer and you know that MEP engineer is not going to want to hear from the biologist you know (laughs) that that they know better about something so I think that that like human piece of it is is really really important, and it requires an ability and an enough time in the budget of the project that those sustainability professionals can go and literally sit with the engineers and take time to the point that even if if the person has to say, "Let me show you how to do this. Let me show you how this all fits into the bigger synergy." Yeah, and um. And, and, and you have to just kind of hack back and forth at it and be willing to walk down the road with them that way. And if you're not, I don't actually think you're really facilitating. It's got to be that yeah. collaborative. And, and, and sometimes, particularly when you're working with um, a, a, an accreditation professional who's 
maybe from an outside shop or you're an integrative team of a lot of small specialist companies, you don't have the time or even the physical proximity to have that kind of intimacy in the IDP. And I think that's another reason why people get stuck back into the silos. You know, you bring up a great point, and it reminds me of the uh, industrial design firm IDO. And I don't know if you two are familiar with IDO, but uh, their whole philosophy is in designing products for human purposes to bring in people from multiple backgrounds. So when they were developing the mouse for Steve Jobs in the first uh, Apple system, you know, they had people with backgrounds that were and had nothing to do with computers. And they do that with everything that they develop. And uh I think, you know, these people, like in your case, the, the, the individual that had the, uh, the biology background, those are useful people to have on a design team because they come with a set of filters that are very useful in the design process, but they're not of sort of the, the norm, like the, the, the standard MEP filter, right? Yeah, I, I see what you're saying there. I mean, I know what Holly's talking about. Some design meeting is like an episode of Mad Men, right? It's all guys in there <laughs> being guys. And, you know, they don't want to talk about anything that's that's adjacent and possible, basically. Right, right. You know, it's, right. it's crazy. It's hard. Sometimes this industry is hard to change, right? And it's a lot of it's doing what you've always done and getting what you've always got. So lead has been, and sustainability is being a good agitator for change, but it is tough. And if you are not an engineer, how many engineers have you ever heard have said, I don't know how to do that or I'm not sure? I can't think of many engineers I've heard say that. Have you, Robert? Have you, Holly? No. No, I I mean, never, never out loud and particularly never in front of a client. And and probably, you know, it's understandable why they would never want to say it in front of a client because a client is just investing so much. But there, there really is something to be said for having an environment where you just repeatedly say, um, you know what, we, we, we need to achieve at least one failure today. You know, we need to run into one wall and to give permission for that. And I mean, for, for, for me, part of the reason why I really enjoy this work is because I love the fact that if you really look hard at some great projects or pay, perhaps people that you admire, they have some comfort level with running into a wall now and again, or a big fat failure. And maybe you don't want that failure to emerge in DD, but to, to have some ideas just really fall flat and concept or scheme is, is a, probably a, a good thing, you know? You've highlighted a good point there, right? So in building design, it's very unusual for something novel to come up and for, for it to fail and everyone go, okay, that's a failure, let's learn from it and move on, right? Everyone's looking, looks around the table when a design meeting goes, right, you give me the answer to this. You give me the answer to that, right? And that's maybe what the industry needs to do. It need, there needs to be able, it needs to be safe, certainly a schematic design to fail or have a bad idea, but might be novel, right? Yes. This is something, maybe this is the evolution of our industry, maybe. But there's always a cost associated with that failure and who bears that cost. And I've been in meetings where failure has occurred and you can see the the blood run out of the architect's face. (laughs) 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 Because you know there's no money in the budget for them to deal with the failure. But it was a it was a massive failure and they had to deal with it. And they had to deal with it with all of the professionals around the table. It's more or less like a public flogging almost, right? (laughs) Uh, well, I, right. guess that, I guess that's why it's so important to really, really have that experimentation time in, in concept, like if you actually have the project from concept. I mean, over here, there's so many projects where, um, you know, like if we're working with a signature architect, we might not get the project till well into schematic design, um, and, and you won't necessarily have that opportunity for experimentation. But if you do have it, from the very beginning and the, you know, the goal is to have really, really solid ideas by the time you're at the end of schematic design that are, that are then going to be preserved. I think that that, that cost impact can be avoided. And, and also then you get the commitment of people to preserve and to preserve through particularly like 
third party value engineering <laughs> or, <laughs> or, or what I call sustainability devalue engineering in many oh, instances, yeah. you know, if you don't have a VE team that necessarily was on board and, and fully understanding that the owner's performance requirements have a performance that has to be preserved and they're doing just a cost cutting exercise rather than a genuine value engineering and, and yeah. you know, enhancing performance. So yeah, I guess getting people, particularly engineers, to show up very, very early on is key to have that experimentation and and, and laboratory kind of environment without it, as Robert said, tanking the budget or making the, the architect faint. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, Holly, it's it's interesting. In our design practice, we try to get to the client before they actually hire the architect. And the reason why we do that is because as an engineering firm, we can provide the owner with an indoor environmental specification and we can provide them with an energy budget. And once they have those two pieces of the puzzle, then they can go to the architect and say, okay, we need a building that can work within these specifications and this allowance for energy. And then the architect now has at least some parameters around the design. And it seems, at least for our practice, it works really well. It's kind of awkward because it goes against the grain of traditional design practice, but it works. I'm not surprised to hear you say that. And I th- I love hearing that that's what you're doing already because I describe that as teaching the client that performance is beauty as much yeah. as architecture, okay? Part of our mission really is teaching clients that performance is beautiful. And that's a whole cultural change. It's not just about technology and kit and engineering. It's, it's that diffusion of... Um, of ideas into the cultural uh, culture of beauty of architecture. I mean, it's really, really important. And it's not something that happens as quickly as technology actually evolves. And um, I think that it's a subtlety so that you're doing that and you're out like ahead of architecture to me makes perfect sense. And I'm not surprised that you're having success with it, but, but you're unusual. I, I mean, at least from over in this part of the world, people aspire to have that thought leadership with clients. And it, it's, it's a, a beautiful thing that you're already doing that. Well, really you've cool. just, you said something that was really profound and, and Adam, I think you're going to agree with it. You know, performance is beautiful and it can be an art form. Performance can be an art form, uh, although it may not be something that you visually see but you do feel it and you do, of course, have to pay for that at some point. So I think what you've said there, that that performance is beautiful, is something that anybody that understands the marketing, and we've been talking about marketing and tra- uh, branding, could run with that in a really big way. Holly, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's a great piece of wisdom. I think that was the, I think that was the money shot. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Yeah, well, that was, that's awesome. Yeah, I like that. It's informed, you know, that idea that that performance of a building is is beautiful is informed by many things. I mean, it's like um, if you look at some of the exciting work about human health and how it can either thrive or decline in the built environment that's come out in the past couple of years. I really love the COGFX studies that were done by Harvard School of Public Health Mm -hmm. and uh, Syracuse University. And what they really showed through those double blind studies is that, um, you know, a a high performing building with enhanced air diffusion is a high performing human. And I think that that aspect besides energy efficiency and resource efficiency in a building that humans are more efficient also helps diffuse this whole idea that we should really be thinking about those goals, like what you said, Robert, with the the owner ahead of time. You know, for example, if you've got someone who wants to build a new commercial property or a new mixed use property, wouldn't they want as one of their key brand indicators that not only is the building resource efficient, but it was designed with human productivity and efficiency in mind. And I know that when I've gone into buildings that were designed with those attributes, I want to be in them. Like, cause I, I, yeah. I have, Clients who are in buildings like that, and I love going for meetings at those buildings. I, I love it. It's really fantastic to to experience it. 
you you touched on something interesting for me as well because I believe for me I'm an architecture fan for me architecture is an art form but architecture at a national level is an expression of culture right buildings change slowly because culture changes slowly right I'm an Englishman when I moved to Canada I wanted a brick built building with a proper roof did not get that in North America at all but culturally <laughs> that's what I was programmed for right and in the Middle East where Holly works, you know, buildings, airport buildings, trophy buildings, they are nationalistic trophies. They're very prideful things, right? Would you agree with that, Holly? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I think some of the evolution of what defines beauty here um, has been, it's been really, really interesting to watch because you can see where the North American more idea of, of beauty has had an impact here. I mean, if you if you look at um, some of the high rises that are done by signature architects, you can see where at the moment in time they were designed, that they were more about a North American ideal of beauty that people here were interested in. And yet then when you go back to um, some of these cultural buildings, whether it's museums or airports, uh, social infrastructure that's come really, I want to say in the past five years, we're starting to see that people have wanting to be deeply connected back to more traditional roots and not to do like some Disneyland idea of what the Middle East should be, but how does the Middle East idea of beauty and performance through passive design manifest in significant social infrastructure like a, a new airport or, you know, a new university or hospital. Um, and it, it's really great to see those subtleties of change. And hopefully we'll come to a time where you won't have buildings popping up here that look like they could be in New York or yeah. Chicago, right, but, yeah, yeah. but, you know, like yeah. the the classic, you know, refrigerator in a, a glass uh <laughs> box that is just sucking yeah. energy and emitting carbon and um but was yeah. very uh, uh trendy here yeah. for a period of time yeah, for a long period i i agree i agree i want to circle back to estadama for a bit i'm really interested in the policy work you did there before you joined keo so how would you say the government are very active and probably one of the biggest property developers in the uae are they happy with estadama and how it's sitting in the market well, Estadam, I'd rather, I, rather than describe people as being happy or, or not happy mm -hmm. with it, because I think re regardless of where you are in the world, when you bring in a, a new movement and make it into like a code application, like is, which in a way, Estadama, because it's mandatory, it's like a code. Um, yeah. Even though it's a green building rating, it's being used in a way that you cannot pass go of getting a building permit without having it. And, and then inevitably people will have some unhappiness about that because until they go through the learning curve of it, you know, there's yeah. going to be a reaction in the market, like just, just the same way there is anywhere internationally. So how I like to really describe Estadama at this point is that it has maturity. And if you go into any company, everybody knows that you have to do Estadama. Everybody understands that it's a part of a building process and the minimum performance requirements of Estadama are now just normal. So there's not the kind of reaction of resistance. It's really great to see in the market that even all the way down into the um, contracting field that um, we have contractors who are saying as a method of differentiation from the competition, oh, you want a two pearl Estadama rating? Well, I can give you a three pearl Estadama rating for the same price. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. that to me is, is really, really cool that people have gotten to the point that they understand the rating enough that even in construction, they know how to enhance a rating because I'm sure you both know that ratings often fall apart in construction. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, maybe the design team has manipulated the scorecard, you know, which goes back to that checklist thinking so that too much responsibility is put on the contractor and things slide in construction in kind of the early days of, of uh, having sustainable design as a a mandate, but that, that just doesn't happen anymore. So I'm sure that 
anywhere, if you have small shops where they have to go out of house for everything, you're probably still going to find people who are really looking to get multiple bids on their services. And that reflects an overall tightness in the market, I think, rather than anything having to do with Estadama. But when I look around the overall GCC at the different rating systems being used, whether it's GSAS, Dubai Green Building Regs, or Estadama, a lot of people will say that Estadama has really helped create a, a positive path forward for all of them. Okay, I've just got one more question on Estadama. No phone a friend. <laughs> Is it likely to be updated in the near or distant future, do you think? I think it might be, but I'm not in a position to hard confirm that. There has been a discussion of updates for for some time. Um, I think it would be great if it was updated. I think the market's ready for an update, yeah. but... I think that the government, not just in Abu Dhabi, but across the, the, the whole Middle East is, is very sensitive to being um, mindful of the impact of change, of updates of any code right now, just because of the volatility due to the oil crash and everything. Yeah, here. agreed, agreed. Hey, I have a question for both of you, and it has to do with keeping the integrity of the word sustainability intact. And, and let's maybe set this up. You know, when I, I, this is my, I think my 35th year in the industry. And when I got started, efficiency was the, was the big word. And then it moved into green. And then as soon as green sort of became marketed and branded, it lost its meaning. And now sustainability is sort of shoved green out of, not shoved it out of the way, but it's kind of displacing it. And sustainability is becoming the, the big word. Do you, either of you see sustainability getting to that point where it loses its meaning? And if it does, ultimately, when we look at all of these terms, it comes down to earth stewardship. And so what happens when we get to earth stewardship? Does, do we finally destroy that term too? Or? Molly, Molly, you go first. <laughs> well, I, I, I actually, since about 2010, 10, I've referred to sustainability as the S word. <laughs> <because it's> so, <laughs> Incognito. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, it is so, so overused and it has for many people lost, lost meaning um, and, and can have so many meeting meanings depending where you are. So for me right now to, to give it integrity with my team, I've really tried to of course, we, we always are motivated by resource efficiency and earth stewardship, global stewardship. But for me, I really like to underscore that sustainability has an economic component. And, and by bringing into the forefront just how powerful that economic component of sustainability can be, that that helps it have meaning with normal people who aren't practitioners of sustainable design and to help it have um, like a, a motivating force for them to want it to be part of their brand. So that that's my real simple take on it right now. Adam, let's hear what you have to say on that. So, yeah, I, I agree with you. Sustainability is a very nebulous, loosey-goosey word, right? It means something different to everybody. So it's a, like most things in our industry, there's a major branding problem going on here, right? So in my last business I sold last year, I used to – forbid people to use the word sustainability or green. We used to talk about high-performance buildings because people yeah. don't understand that, right? A high-performance car, I'm a Porsche man, right? I love Porsches, right? So people are willing to pay a lot of money for a Porsche, right? It's a high-performance car and you know what you get in, like buying an Apple laptop is a high-performance laptop, right? So we talk, I talk about high-performance buildings because high-performance, you can apply a metric to that, is it? energy usage index, is it whatever, right? There are, there are markers you can lay down. So when someone says it's green, the question should, next question out of everyone's mouth should be, how is it green? Is it sustainable? How is it sustainable? Well, we say lead gold, lead silver, lead platinum, right? But those are moving goalposts. Um, there's no lead gold for before high performance cars. There's I like a Porsche or I like a Mercedes or I like an Audi, right? I like my German cars. So I always talk about high-performance buildings. You will never hear the word sustainability or green come out of my mouth in a client meeting ever. 
and that's how I deal with it. Now, the, that doesn't acknowledge the economic side of it. I like that point, Holly, because as an ex-property developer myself, I can tell you it's the dollars and cents that drive them, guys. <laughs> that's it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and I think if, if we're not standing on their side of the fence and, and really understanding what that means to them, we're actually failing uh, to introduce meaning of sustainability to them. And, and that's our bad. All right. So here's the, here's the answer to that, I think. Right. So whenever you see a property developer, there's a few things you notice. A, they're not normally poor, right? Yeah. B, they drive nice cars, normally German. Right? <laughs> so they're willing to buy high-performance laptops, high-performance watches, high-performance cars, even high-performance wives, some of them, right? So right. yet for some reason, they want a high-performance building for the same price they pay for the piece of shit commodity building they built last year. So yeah, there yeah. is a problem in this industry, right? And it starts at the top, in my opinion. So, yeah. and I can say that well, as I used to be a property developer, so I'm allowed to criticise them. Well, I know the scenario you just painted is is one I'm I'm also really familiar with. Um, I okay, this might sound far out there, because, but but I actually think. Um, I actually think the whole introduction of near zero and net zero energy projects coming in that vernacular of performance coming into the market is going to be a way that developers can start to understand the economic reasoning behind high performance buildings in a way that they don't necessarily with like a lead platinum or a, um, Lead Gold or Estadam, a high-rated project, and and I think it's just be, because it's so much easier to focus on the cost of energy management and the, yeah. the value of operations, and and that's actually for for me. I mean, a, a, a big part of my team's core business will always be ratings, but um, but my own work uh, strategically in my team right now is about taking the understanding of near zero and net zero to developers and spending yeah. a lot of time talking to them about that and the economics of it and trying to change what you were describing, Adam. And it, it does, light bulbs do go off. <laughs> you know? yeah. My challenge with net zero, and I totally agree with everything that you just said, my challenge with net zero is that it puts an emphasis on energy rather than on the occupants. And so what we are seeing is net energy, net zero energy buildings that are being designed and constructed with no regard to the indoor environment. And so we have, you know, as long as you can solve a problem with energy, if that energy doesn't cost you anything, then you can build whatever the heck you like. And so we see buildings that still continue to be all glass structures and we forget about you know, the, the environment that's created by all glass, glass structures. And we have lots of shortwave radiation coming in. It destroys artwork. It creates discomfort. It's bright if you don't use a proper uh, glazing system. So I agree. I, I'm, I'm all bored for the net zero energy and where that's going, but I think it needs to have that human factor tied into it somehow. And I don't know how we do that. I agree with you. And and my, in my design, uh, in my team, my top Talent say exactly what you're saying. My, I have two building physicists who are senior uh, sustainability managers in my team, and whenever uh, we talk about this topic, they bring up issues of uh, indoor environmental quality and how is it all going to stay together. And particularly in this part of the world, where it is so easy because of the lack of robust facilities management to get a mold situation in a building anyway. You know, when you start looking at these higher performance tight, tight, tight buildings, and if they're not managed, yeah, it's a, it can be an IEQ disaster, really. But to just take it back to why I think developers, in the most simplistic sense, respond a little bit is uh, to this idea of very low energy use buildings is it, it's really simple to say um, in a market where there's vacant units and it becomes a tenant's market or a buyer's market that if you have the two equivalent properties, except one is really low energy use and the other isn't, and, and you're going to save half on your operations costs, which one are you going to rent? Is it going right. to be or buy? 
And that's something that maybe didn't matter when there was still this incredible lack of units available in the Middle East. But now, you know, the development cycle has been clocking on here for a while. And it, there's a lot of uh, property available that, you know, even a few years ago, this amount of property didn't exist. So now developers really have to have a, a you know, a, um, a market standard that's going to be appealing on that level. And and to put it even more in a way that developers think, it's about finance. Like if, if you're a big league property developer and you're going out for international, fi- like um, just because there's a lot of money in the, in the Middle East doesn't mean it's easy to borrow, for example. So say, say you have to go out for finance to international funds, for example, maybe people who uh, deal with REITs or people that are behind real estate that ends up in pension funds. And a lot of those entities now want to know that there's a sustainability or ESG approach on those buildings. And that that idea that you're going to have a easier borrowing process has meaning to a developer that I think is, is very motivating. So it's like the thing of the economics of how quickly you can get rid of your property, lease it or sell it, and also just even before that, you know, at the very beginning of the cycle of development, is it easier to get a loan because you have a high performance approach, you know, that your ESG is, is built around really, really strong um, energy fundamentals. And, and, and you see that, like, I don't know if you guys are familiar with GRES, the Global Real Estate Sustainability Benchmark. No, no. This, this, this is, um, it's another uh, system that is administered by GBCI which, you know, administers LEED, and it's p- portfolio-based annual assessment of, a, of developers' performance on their portfolios. And oh, I, yeah. I think it's a really, really cool system that speaks to developers and, and has an opportunity to create change that you just aren't going to do on an individual building basis in terms of impacting how developers think. I think that's the way to influence developers. They're competitive by nature. They like, they look, look at me. No, no, look at me, right? So that's what you've got to go for. That's why I think the zero, the low carbon, zero carbon, net zero thing might go somewhere because there's always going to be a developer who wants to have that badge because the other guy hasn't got it, right? Yeah, I, I, I think so. But we'll, we'll see because maybe, you know, what Robert was saying, maybe as we have more of these projects if you know they are operated for a few years and they become a you know a catastrophe in terms of public health the whole movement <laughs> will just yeah crash and burn that's the risk right that's the risk side of this equation if you're an engineer and a developer and architect you stick your neck out and you do something awesome and then through a consequential effect that you didn't see coming i don't know it becomes a public health issue there's a mold growth issue then you're done, right? That is the risky side of it. Yeah, yeah. And I guess, you know, those of us who look back in the history of when we first really became exposed to the idea of sick building syndrome, it was after the first oil crash in North America and suddenly people were like, tighten the buildings up, tighten, 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 tighten. But without this idea of balancing for human health and a lot of of buildings were, were bad. Yeah, they cut they cut down the outside air, and all of a sudden, everyone's got IAQ problems, right? Yeah, it's 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 interesting thing. This is why our industry is awesome in a way, right? There are so many areas where you can innovate and do something. This it's so ripe for change in so many different directions. Now, I think it's an exciting time to come into this business as a developer, an architect, an engineer, a consultant. You know, there's there's value to add here, right? Oh, yeah. For sure. The issue is shaking the box and sort of, you don't want a revolution, you want evolution, right? Because, you know, revolution, there's always collateral damage. But with an evolution, but for me, I'm looking for faster evolution, I guess, right? That's what I'm frustrated with. I have a question, uh, Holly, for you in terms of demographics in the Middle East. And, you know, the I'm not a climate change expert. I would never even admit to being a climate change expert because that just involves darts in your back and that kind of stuff. So, But I do uh, use the word climate changes of consequence. So in terms of demographics, and you're looking at here in North America, we have a large aging population that are moving into buildings which are a static enclosure. 
And so as changes of, in the climate occur that have a consequence on the outside, of course, that gets transmitted to the inside. What's happening in the Middle East in terms of looking at elderly populations, the infirm uh, infants that, you know, as climate does change, are they recognizing the, the impact that that has on the inside of the environment? And how are they designing their buildings to accommodate that? We are starting to have discussions about this topic, um, about resilience of, of buildings to these changes in IDP sessions. I would say I've been hearing people talk about it for maybe two to three years, particularly you find people who are facade experts talking about it, this whole understanding that uh, we want to be designing for a life of a building that could be 50 years, although historically here, there's a lot of buildings that don't even last 20 years in the, in the past. Um, wow. But yeah. 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 I mean, it's, this is a very young place and the original mm -hmm. wave of development here was um, really about just getting stuff up um, and getting development rolling. Um, so a lot of those buildings are being torn down now and being replaced. But so there, yes, there are discussions about the fact that as the climate continues to become more onerous, that um, we need to have created systems that can address this. Are people articulating it specifically to vulnerable populations? I have not heard that. Um, I mean, I've personally, with my team from very early days, tried to teach people that the more you help identify that vulnerable populations um, are stakeholders in our overall process, you are likely likely to impact on the owner, um, whether it's because they have older family members or they see themselves as eventually becoming vulnerable. You know, it's right. a way to, to motivate people to maybe be, to to have them not just so uh, fixated on a single bottom line. Um, but is right. it common practice? No. Do I see people, you know, like in conferences, because I speak at a lot of conferences and I chair a lot of conferences, are there panels specifically about how are we caring for future vulnerable populations? Not yet, but having heard you bring up the question, I'm going to start telling people here. <laughs> so you go, go Agi agitation for change. I like that. <laughs> so, Holly, we got to wrap up soon, but I do want to have a very quick discussion with you about being a woman in a, in a man's world, quite frankly. So, you know, I've, I've, I'm a father of two daughters. One of my daughters is studying to be an engineer. I am incredibly interested in what it's like for a woman to move through our industry. And you are in a very influential position there, and kudos for that. Congratulations on that. And you know, what's it like being a woman heading up her team in a big consultancy like KEO and being a woman operating in an area where, let's be honest, is a very male-dominated environment? You know, when people ask me this question, because I'm a part of a firm that has a CEO who is a woman and is a very strong Really, I see her as almost a, an iconic figure in our industry for what she's done, spearheading women in leadership. I don't actually feel that I am subject to any kind of suppression of my ideas or ability to to push my team ahead because of being a woman in terms of the way the Middle East might, might be perceived. I've never felt that culturally here that I've been um, held back because of being a woman. Now, our industry globally is a male-dominated industry, and particularly engineering is a predominantly male-dominated industry. And getting women in MEP is something that needs a lot of focus and encouragement all the way from, you know, when you've got kids who are choosing between what they're going to take in their junior and senior year in high school. Are they going to keep doing sciences and maths? And I myself, when I was a, a young woman, I, I did do science and math in high school, but in my original undergraduate studies, I didn't take math. And when I retrained into the field I'm in now, I had to do all of that. And it was 
in devastatingly hard. And yeah. I just, you know, the message that I, I like to put out to any woman, young woman, um, is that don't ever second guess the value of math and science and, and how it, if you have math and science, it doesn't matter what you want to do. It's not, you're going to have more strength in areas that are perceived to be a man's world, whether it's, you know, our industry or uh, any any industry, you know, banking, <laughs> the law, anything. Uh, um, yeah. Math and science has, has value. So I can't say that there's been some magic formula other than uh, that I, I'm under an extremely strong female leader. And also there, there are quite a few opportunities here for female leadership. The government here, particularly in the UAE, is pushing women into leadership. And I think I've had that benefit as well. That's good to hear and, and well said. So what advice would you give my daughter when she graduates NYU? <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Inshallah. Well, just any any young person, whether but particularly, uh, I would say with with women, always give yourself the room to change your mind, and that changing your mind about what you want to do, and that giving yourself permission is a strength. Don't feel that your base study, the base commitment that you've made. Um, is something that you have to tie yourself to for life because the ability to to pivot and be nimble and to follow um, the discovery of the highest and best use of your talent is frequently not what you originally chose to do in life. And 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 as I said, um, even if you think you will never go into a math and science oriented field you know, suck it up and get through it because it's a lot harder. <laughs> I mean, seriously, it's so much harder to go back and get through it when, you know, if you're, if you're trying to do stuff, you know, to reinvent uh, your career path and you have to go back and, and do those things later in life, it, it's hard. So I would say make room for math and science when, when you're in your undergrad and grad, even if you don't think you're going to be in a field that, demands it i have to say i underline that completely so my I, I went did my bachelor's and master's in my early 30s and mid, so late 20s to mid 30s and it was brutal right <laughs> what i should yeah. have done was just put my head down when i left school and stayed in technical college and gone all the way but i didn't because i thought it was gonna be a professional skateboarder that's how delusional i was <laughs> So there you go. <laughs> well, you know, one other thing, I'll just say this is my closing uh, comment. And I think this carries us through all delusions that we have as we <laughs> grow through our careers that, you know, when you really, really hit the wall about something that you're doing in your career and you maybe you have a moment of just being lost, if you always shift back to thinking, OK, I can't figure it out about what to do for myself. But if I focus is on what can I do through my work to positively impact other people, the door will appear and open for you, you know? So put, it, put your focus out to how, how can I, uh, through my actions, take the focus off of me and put it onto others. And, and that will, uh, at least in my experience, that's the, the breakthrough point. Adam, do you feel like we've been talking to Gandhi? Yeah, I know. It's just, I'm feeling there's a lot of wisdom. There's a lot of knowledge and wisdom being dropped here. I love no, it. it. That's great. <laughs> so, Holly, on that, that's a great way to wrap this up, actually. I've, I really enjoyed speaking to you. It was really good getting your perspective on everything. And, uh, you know, I, for me, as a father of two daughters, I love it when I see women in high-powered jobs, you know, breaking ceilings, just taking the men on at their own game. That's exactly how it should be in my world. And, you know, well done for that. Thank you. And I, I uh, welcome questions from any young women via social media about breaking through as a woman leader. It's a, a great topic to discuss. Excellent. OK, well, thank you very much for coming on. Where can people find you on social media and on the Internet? I'm uh, on Twitter as Holly underscore Eco Chick. Maybe you, you can put that in your yeah. show notes. Yeah, um, we will. And and LinkedIn. Those are my two social media presence points. I'm not a really a big Facebook person, so 
Yeah, yeah. So just back in the truck up, kudos on that Twitter handle, Holly Eco Chick. Love that. <laughs> That's great. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put I'll put that in the show notes. I'll put your connections in the show notes for people. And I'd I'd encourage any female STEM students or engineers, contact Holly. Take her as a role model. So Holly was pretty awesome. I really, really enjoyed speaking to her. That was a great interview for me. I felt inspired. I, I don't I did wrong word, wrong tense. I feel inspired. Yeah. She made some statements that were just uh, profound and uh, was such a deep wisdom that the you know the world needs to hear what she has to say. I agree, hundred percent. I love that that statement she came up. Performance is beauty, right? It's yeah. beautiful. so true. Yeah, you know, we think in the world of architecture and building design that you know aesthetics, you know, matters, and yeah. and the reality is, I mean, that is that's true. I mean, you made a good point during the interview that that, that and that's very true. But performance as a form of beauty yeah. is something I'd never, ever thought of. And, I, you know, I think about some strange stuff, as, as you do. Yeah. But why is it we've never thought about performance as beauty until she brought it up? And I think that's why we found it so profound. It was great. So that's the other thing she was talking about, right? The adjacent non-cognitive professional, right? So right. we don't see that beauty because we're so in the middle of what we're doing. We're in our own way. She's at an adjacent angle to what we're doing and sees that beauty, right? Right, yeah. And that's the benefit of integrated design, people coming in from adjacent fields and, and contributing. I think that's awesome. I really like that. The other, the other thing I like that she came out with was, was you know, the struggle for sustainable, uh, sustainability ideas and concepts to survive value engineering exercises. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so true. Yeah, isn't that the truth? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but uh, that, that that was great. I, I I find her very inspiring, actually. And as a father of two girls, you know that she's a great example of you know what what's possible in STEM. Yeah, she you know, and that was one of the one of the comments that she uh, made that really sort of resonated with me. And that in terms of you know don't don't fear making those career changes or don't see that as a weakness that you have to change. See it as a strength. Yeah, correct. Right. Uh, that's just that's just wisdom and advice that transcends, you know, all genders, yeah. all ages, yeah. uh, all cultures. Uh, it's it was really good. You know, in a way, you do a disservice focusing on the fact that she is a, a woman in a male-dominated industry. But you know, that shouldn't matter at all, right? No, great, no, great no, work not is at great all. work. Great people are great people. It shouldn't matter, and hopefully, it won't in the future. You know. Yeah, I to- I totally agree with that, and yeah. uh, you know it's and it's in many ways it's unfortunate that you know v- vision has so much to do with our way that we judge the world around us, and the, and and being of different genders, of course, you see the differences. But in fact, if we removed vision from from our judgment, the world would become a lot more equal uh, across many yeah. many aspects. Yeah, no, that was that was great. I think uh, you know maybe six months from now or a year from now we should definitely try and get her on again. So I'm sure she'll be up to something quite interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You uh, bet. Okay. All right. Well, that was a great interview. I think I shall wrap it up because it's late tonight. These these international interviews, man, they, <laughs> they make for some strange times. <laughs> they do. They do. You've been listening to the Edifice Complex podcast with Adam Muggleton and Robert Bean. To access show notes for this episode, visit edificecomplexpodcast.com. If you have enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a review on iTunes. See you next time.